Hello, I'm Harvey Ambrose. I am preaching this message today on behalf of the Missionary Baptist Voice of Africa radio program that is broadcast out of our radio station in Monrovia, Liberia. We are continuing in our study of the book of Exodus. We are in chapter 7, and I'll begin the reading in verse 19. <clears throat> Exodus seven nineteen. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. <clears throat> and Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod, and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians digged round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the river. And uh, not rehearsing the history of this thus far, we just need to understand that after multiple warnings by God and having certainly through the Spirit uh, convicting them of sin, the sin of idolatry through the worship of an innumerable host of false gods and idols, but also in the enslavement of a people who had done nothing uh, to them and had actually been a blessing to the Egyptians, namely uh, the children of Israel who had gone there to sojourn. Finally, they enslaved these people and mistreat them. And God heard their cries and he sends Moses down to bring his people up from Egypt and to deliver them into that land which he had promised to their fathers, Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob. These are the sons of the children of Jacob called of God Israel. So the children of Israel. Well, if people won't hear God, when, when God, uh, through the Spirit, afflicts their conscience over sin, if when God repeatedly works in the hearts of men to reprove them that what they're doing is wrong and it is an offense against God himself, if they won't heed that, then it's appropriate that they be punished for their disobedience. And that is what begins to happen here with the story of the waters being turned to blood. You know, previously, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and just said, God said, let the people go and worship me in the wilderness. And, and Pharaoh said, uh, you know, who is the Lord that, that I should obey him? And I'm not going to let the people go. So he rejected uh, what God had told through his servant Moses. And then when they went back and they showed a sign because Pharaoh said, you know, show me a sign, show me a miracle whereby I can know something about this God of yours because he said, I don't know him. Who is he? So God shows him who he is with uh, turning the the rod into a serpent but because of trickery uh, Pharaoh's magicians are able to simulate that it says with their enchantments which in that verse verse 11 means uh, with their flames so they had a flame or a fire and smoke that, that obscured that the fact that they were uh, that they were substituting in a moment of time, uh, their rods or staffs into serpents. Uh, 
much like magicians do today. Well, because of that, it says, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, meaning he, uh, he says, well, okay, you did a trick, and magicians, the, my magicians do tricks too, the same trick. So uh, even though the fact that the, uh, you know, the, the, the serpent that had been Moses' rod devoured all the serpents that had been made through trickery, are presented uh, through trickery of the Egyptian magicians. So now, um, God has had enough of it. And he's going to cease to just warn. He's going to start punishing. And he punishes by, by taking that which Egypt uh, thought, and appropriately thought, in terms of physicality, to be the bringer of all life uh, to the land of Egypt. Were it not for the great river that runs through it, it's not named here in our text, but it certainly would be the Nile. Uh, it's the principal river of Egypt, always has been, ever since there was an Egypt. Before it was a Egypt, I guess, probably the Nile ran through it. That's why people settled there and raised crops there. That's why it was so productive there, is the inundation of the land on a yearly basis by the Nile River, still is to this day. It fed the world at one time. All the Mediterranean Sea, that whole area was fed by grain uh, that was raised there because of the Nile. They saw the Nile as the bringer of life, the giver of life, without which there was no life. It also, they ate lots of fish. They loved fish. We, we can read in, uh, in Numbers chapter 11, uh, when the mixed multitude was brought out by Moses into the wilderness and they began to complain about the, the bread that God had given them, which they called manna, came down from heaven and fed them every day. They began to complain. And they began to long in their complaints. They began to, to rehearse all the, um, all the good food they had had in Egypt, which they were now missing. In uh, Numbers chapter 11, or yeah, in verse 4, we read, in the mixed multitude, what that means is there were Egyptians that came out along with the children of Israel. It wasn't just Jewish ethnic people. It was Gentiles and Jews together that God delivered out and he made them all to be the nation of Israel. The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. They were coveting something. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? They wanted more than the bread. We remember the fish, which we did eat in Egypt freely. Cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Well, people, it's interesting to me that having been delivered from slavery, they're complaining about foodstuffs, miraculously uh, given to them every single morning, fresh by God. People are uh, people are really wicked when they, uh, you know, you're wicked and I'm wicked to the extent that we we uh, look upon the things that God graciously gives us every day, all of our food, all of the air that we breathe, the water that we drink. These things are provided by God; they belong to Him. And yet he gives them to us. We think that we get them, or we think that they're just there for the having, and that God was not involved in. But that's a that's a that's not true. That's not how things truly are. God provides these things. We call it his providence. He a provider. He he provides to the people of this earth all that's needed on a daily basis. We take it for granted. And not only do we take it for granted as though it just happened as opposed to coming from God or somehow we, you know, we, we certainly may have worked in order to buy it, but the fact that it exists at all, come, it comes from God. But we don't see it that way. We see it as the result of our labors and we don't give God credit for it. And when it becomes in a degree of scarcity, so in other words, we, we don't think about God when we partake of it. I mean, too many of us don't. But then when it becomes scarce or it becomes, uh, well, where we just have, you know, a very limited 
type of food that we can eat. We're only eating this. We're only eating that. There's, there's not much uh, diversity of food available to us. Even that which we eat ceases to please us. If you eat the same thing every day and only the same thing every day, no matter how good it is, you get tired of it. And then we complain to God. We didn't thank him for it. Well, we just ate it all the time when we were happy with it. But when something, just a little something, like not enough diversity in our food, and we, or there's not enough, it's a little bit scarce. We say, why, how, how is it that God can let people starve? And these ridiculous questions, and I'm sorry, I know some of you have written these questions to me, and I, maybe I shouldn't call it ridiculous. I, I can understand people thinking this way, but it's a wrong way to think. Uh, how can a just God, so they're, they really don't think he's just, they just call him just to illustrate their point, which is, I think, their point may be that there is not a God. How can a just God let people starve to death? Well, they didn't give him credit for it when they had it in abundance, but now they blame him for it when it's scarce or when it's plain or when it's doesn't exist and we starve. I think Job was right when he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. He does both. He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. He's good in all that he does. If he takes away our food, that is also to teach us something or to work some other purpose. Perhaps he, perhaps you need to die. Perhaps you have offended God to the point where he's just sick of you. Like he becomes sick of Pharaoh for this is over with. And he takes your life because your continued existence is a, uh, it's a burden to him. He's worked on you. He's, he's worked in your heart. He's, he's tried to show you what sin is. And, and he knows he got through to you, but you didn't heed what he said. You didn't change. You didn't turn to God. Rather, you turn sometimes against God. Well, I'm going too far into that. But uh, I think you get the point. So when they, uh, when uh, Aaron took the rod and, and smote uh, the river, and the word there is, uh, would probably be translated struck or to strike, hit it, he hit the river, it turned to blood. Now, it wasn't just the river. When he hit the river, it, it, it not only turned that striking, uh, smiting of the waters of, of the river also affected the other river. <clears throat> Any tributaries or <clears throat> called them other rivers here in the text. Reservoirs and ponds. Also uh, the vessels of a wood and stone most likely refer to wooden or stone cut cisterns so like you know for for a house uh, or for a palace uh, where you had a like a you know a storage of water so that you're not continuously going somewhere to draw water you've got it stored up in a cistern we still use those to this day in many parts of the world and and uh, in various uh, more out of the way places i mean in alaska we had cisterns and in, in some places where it was hard to get a well in so uh, it affected all the stores of water. I don't believe it affected all the water, and we read about that uh, before we're done here. So uh, the striking, what that means is it's like a to strike, to hit. He hit Egypt by turning its water, the thing that they worshipped, more or less, the, the bringer of life, the, the Nile River, which they credited with all their prosperity was was the Nile. Well, now, instead of bringing life to them, it brought death to all their fish. They loved fish. Uh, and, and I can't, anyway, in Numbers, it talks about how they had so much fish in plenty when they lived in Egypt. But now, all the fish died. It says all the fish died. Not just in the river, I guess, but in all the places. I wonder how long it took for their fish population to come back after seven days of the river being nothing but blood and all the ponds and 
reservoirs and cisterns and all that. What had been a blessing to them sent by God because they wouldn't heed God, he turned it to a curse. What had been life to them now becomes death to one of their principal food stores, namely fish. And also whatever crops could be grown by an inundation of water. Well, now it's an inundation of blood. That wouldn't grow any kind of crop that I'd want to eat. I doubt that you would want to eat it either. And so here it is, the, the thing that they had relied upon suddenly becomes loathsome to them. The thing which they loved and they celebrated and they went, uh, Pharaoh himself was accustomed to going down to the river's edge. God had told Moses and Aaron, you go down to the river's edge, that's where Pharaoh was going to be in the morning. It was a custom of his because I don't know whether he, gave, he thanked false gods for the river or he thanked the river itself. Who knows what he did? But it was some celebration or some worship that Pharaoh regularly engaged it at the water's edge. Well, now they strike it. When you strike a child in our country, it's called a spanking. They get spanked. When they do something wrong, the parent spanks them or, or strikes them. You know, the Bible says, you know, spare the rod, meaning a striking, and spoil the child. If you don't give a corrective uh, spanking, then the child is likely to grow up without any discipline and being kind of wild and disobedient. It happens all the time, and more so and more so in the nation in which I live. I am having trouble today. Perhaps you guys can pray for me from time to time so that I can do better for you. So anyway, it's, it is self-explanatory. They go, they strike it, the water's turned to blood. But then it says in verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. I mean, they did the same thing. They turned water into blood, or so it would appear. Now, whereas in verse 11, enchantments is lahat, and it's translated flames, showing that they used fire and smoke or something to conceal what they did when they, when they substituted serpents for what had been rods in their hands, and no one could see it because of the fire and smoke. Here it just used the words enchantment, translated from the word, not lahat, but lot, L-A-T. And so that word means secrets or secretly. So it's like they, they secretly, without people noticing, we don't know whether they use flames or something else, but they, whatever they did, they did, they, they, there was an effort to conceal what they were doing. They were not open about it. You know, whether they drew a curtain or whatever and, and changed, you know, uh, one pot that was supposedly full of water then turns it to blood, you know, and look like they did the same thing. In any case, the word there means they did it through uh, secret behavior. I don't believe that it was a real miracle. But it was real enough for Pharaoh because it says, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. When he saw that his magicians did something, what he considered, it was enough for him to think, well, okay, well, they made water into blood. Moses and Aaron did. Well, so can my magicians. So why should I listen to this God of theirs? Well, I mean, <laughs> when you just think about the, the matter of scale, so when Aaron took Moses' rod and boat, the river, and all the water that was in storage in, in rivers and ponds and cisterns throughout the land of Egypt turns to blood and it kills all the fish. That's not to be really compared against some magicians who secretly, in other words, through some means of concealment, appear to cause water to turn to blood. Now, you might ask where the water came from. And my interpretation of what he means by vessels of water and vessels of stone, 
meaning cistern that came from the Septuagint translation and that's what it says it says cisterns wooden cisterns and stone or rock cisterns just storage things for the house and uh, as opposed to drinking glasses or bowls uh, made of wood and stone Egypt doubtless had both the cisterns and the drinking vessels it could be uh, that they got the water from that was already stored in an urn or in a bowl or in some kind of a pot or in a glass and made that appear to have been turned into blood. The scale is completely, overwhelmingly dissimilar. It's a tiny thing that the magicians made to appear to have happened versus what was done completely in the open. It says right in front of Pharaoh, we read, you know, and in front of his servants, Aaron struck the river and the whole, and the water of the, of the whole land of Egypt turned to blood. Now, had these magicians really had power, if, if God, this God of the, of the Hebrews, this God of, the, of Israel, had smitten, and he did, if he had smitten Egypt with a curse whereby its water was turned to blood, and Pharaoh's magicians had really had power, they would have undone it. They would have struck it, and it would have turned back to water. And that would have been a notable miracle. That would have certainly given someone pause to, to doubt whether or not there's more than one God. There's one God that curses and another God that blesses is how the Egyptians would look at it. But of course they did no such thing. They did a trick. It was very minor. Whatever it was, it was, it was a minor thing. They did not reverse the judgment of God against the land of Egypt, which he had brought upon Egypt because of their sins. Okay, so uh, it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not hearken unto them. By them he means to Moses and Aaron and of course to God through those two. He wouldn't hearken to God. It was God that was given the commandment through these men to send the Israelites out of his land, out of the land of Egypt. And... Uh, and it says here at the end of verse 32 also, as the Lord had said, remember the Lord knew that Pharaoh would behave this way and he warned uh, Moses that that's how it would be, that, that Pharaoh would not listen, would not heed, uh, but eventually he would drive them out. But that he was going to, with many signs and wonders, bring his people out. In fact, we read in this very same um, chapter, chapter 7, back in verse 3, I'll refer you to that. Uh, God speaking to Moses says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. So in other words, he's going to show many things that are supernatural and very powerful to prove who he is. Pharaoh would said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? By the time this is over with, he'll know without any doubt who the Lord is, that he's the true God and an irresistible God, one that you cannot successfully contend with. But the reason I'm making a point of this is I'm going to take us off in a little distraction to John chapter 4 where Jesus more or less says the same words. In John chapter 4, we have an account that Jesus uh, came into Cana of Galilee, where he had formerly worked a miracle by being at a wedding and turning water into wine. Instead of turning water to blood, he turns it to wine. He's, he comes with grace and truth uh, and not judgments when he came. Now, when he comes back, it'll be judgments, but when he came the first time, it was to seek and to save that which was lost. And everything that he did was trying to bring men willingly into submission to himself. When he comes back, 
he will constrain. But in the meantime, he came and he turned water into wine. And then it says in verse 47, and when, it, well, it's in 46, it says that there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him or begged him that he would come down and heal his son, who was at the point of, of death. In verse 48, it says, Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now that, it's not like that only meant that one man. I think that's uh, the Lord commenting upon humanity altogether. Uh, because when he says, except you see signs and wonders, he's talking about miracles, things that are not according to the natural order in this world. They are not something that happens naturally. Something outside of nature happening, something supernatural happening, like healing a boy with just a word who is at the point of dying, or raising a man that's been dead for four days and just with a word telling him to get up and he gets up, or just with a word taking a raging uh, sea of Galilee during a heavy winds storm that was threatening to, to uh, sink a boat. And with a word, he rebukes, Jesus rebukes the elements. He just says, peace. Be still, and it all turns to glass and no wind. What he shows by signs and wonders is who he is. See, Jesus is God. He is God who added to his divine nature, he added human nature. And in his human nature, he, uh, he lived in this world for some 33 and a half years. And people saw him and got to know him and wrote about what he said. And we have it in the New Testament, the things, some of the things that he did and said. And by seeing what Jesus, you know, said and what he did, he makes to us, it makes it clear to us or manifest to us what God is like, because he is God. And, and when he's in, in the form of a man, walking around doing things as a man, he reveals the true nature of God. And that nature is good. It's a, he's good. He's, the Lord is good. He's merciful. He's truthful. He, he has our best interest in mind. He will do all that he can, short of forcing people to be saved, to persuade them to come to him, which is the same as being saved. If you spiritually come to Christ, he'll save you. If in your heart, your, your heart is broken and, and you're seeking after uh, being made clean, being forgiven of sins, being, being fixed, if you are brought to the point of, and it'll be by God's spirit, you're brought low and you're made to think that, and made rightly to see that you're sinful through and through and that you can't get out of your sins on your, your own strength. Maybe you've tried, but you failed. You just keep falling back into it. And you know that you're an offense, not only to God, but to other people. If you're like me, you, you'll just begin to loathe yourself. And it will seem that all hope is gone. But truly, when you reach that point of contrition, that's when things are about to start happening. Suddenly, like all miraculous signs and wonders happen, all of a sudden, and they are complete. They, they suddenly come. There's no natural explanation for them. They are miraculous. They are signs and wonders. And Jesus says, except you see those, you won't believe. And we know that believing here, he means to trust in God. Not just believe in his existence, but you're, you're wholeheartedly trusting God and, and not yourself or not anyone else or not the natural order. You're, you're all, all your hope. When you get saved, all your hope for a future is in God. 
all your hope for the present, all your hope for happiness. If you have any hope at all, when you reach that point of brokenness, that hope is Christ, that he will, that he will help you. Now, if you think of his help as a natural thing, in other words, he gives you a new job, he gives you a new house, he gives you a new wife, he, he, heals, <clears throat> he heals your body, or he heals uh, the body of a child of yours, <coughs> or some other loved one, uh, or, you know, you, you don't know whether he healed it, you, maybe the doctor did, maybe he healed it, you don't really know. It's, it's, it's a thing that you, you can just, you, you see it in, in the course of everyday life, and you think, Okay, well, so if I go to church, and there's a lot of churches that will teach this, it's a, it's a non-sign and wonder type of salvation. In other words, it's a, it's a very natural type of salvation. You, you go to church, and you pay your tithes, and you try not to miss meetings, and you try not to say bad words, and you try not to commit adultery or look at pornography or, or steal or kill or, or gossip. Or, in other words, you try to live right in the flesh, and they'll say, if you do that, and they may have another requirement that you get baptized in water or, or that you take the communion or whatever, whatever they tell you, it's all things you can do. And you can see other people do it. It's all of this world. It's of the world. And you'll say, okay, well, I've done all that, so I guess I'm good. But see, all that happened without a sign or a wonder, without any confirmation from God, without any action from God. You did it all. You were the one that paid your tithe. You were the one that went to church. You were the one that wore the right clothes, said the right things, said the right prayers, learned the right scriptures. You've done all that. See, you kind of saved yourself. But Jesus says, except you see signs and wonders, you cannot believe, meaning you can't be saved. You can't trust God. As I saw God, I can't, call, I can't claim to have trusted him because I didn't know him. I just knew that I wanted to know him. I just knew that I wanted to be forgiven. I wanted to be made clean. I wanted life. And I felt like I was nothing but death inside. But when he saved me, it, it was miraculous. It was, it was not of this world. It was an experience it was fully within my heart, not my body, but my spirit is in my body. So in a sense, I, I sensed it in my body, but I knew that it wasn't my body. It was the spirit within me that God suddenly came into union with, that somehow his spirit had come into, into me and dwelt within me and and, and conversed with my spirit and, and told me that he had forgiven my sins, that he had given me eternal life, that it would never be lost, that and all this happening in, in a moment of time and, and, and peace, peace like I never had in my life suddenly fills my heart. And then joy. I mean, all these things which had, had been so far from me just moments ago. Moments ago, my every thought was death and hell and sorrow and bitterness suddenly replaced with the exact opposite of, of any such dark thought or feeling with pure light and glory from the presence of the Spirit of God within me when he calls me to be born again of God, born from above, a sign and a wonder to me, just little old me, just a nobody, just a wicked man, just a, a rotten sinner who had given up on living right because he couldn't overcome his inherent weakness, meaning mine. God in his mercy, while I was yet in that sinful state, he came into my heart in love, came straight down from heaven 
into this world of sin and darkness and into my heart and he converted darkness to light he converted death to life he converted sorrow to joy unspeakable he converted fear to absolute peace all in a moment and all of it from outside of me from what outside of anything I did could have done or could have expected to happen I knew nothing of these things until it happened and then I owned it it was all mine he, he gave it to me except you see signs and wonders truly until something like that happens within your heart you have not believed with all your heart you have not been saved you know be, uh, to believe that also is a gift of God when God gives you the faith in him that is required that's at the end of having repented fully towards God when you truly with all your heart turns to God he gives you faith it says for by grace are you saved through faith and that meaning the faith and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God not works lest any man should boast I can't boast of what happened to me because it happened to me from God so when Jesus says Signs and wonders are required for you to believe. For you to truly believe, God has to prove it to you, yourself, and your heart. It's, that's not what the world teaches anymore. Very few people teach that, but it's the truth of it. And I think maybe you can see and feel the truth of, of what it would be like if you could read the Old Testament and say, I just wish God would speak to me like he spoke to Abraham. I just wish God would, would communicate to me like he did Moses in the burning bush. I just wish, why didn't, he, why didn't he talk to me like he did Noah and tell me how to preserve myself from a world that's falling apart? Well, he does. That's the little secret anymore. It used to be widely preached, but he does. He yet speaks to people. He yet communicates to the heart of man divinely. Signs and wonders from heaven to the individual person are available. Not only available, they are essential if you are to believe. So if all you can believe in is the things that you do in a church way, your behavior, how you live your life and all that, you'll never trust in God. But if you turn to God with all your heart and repentance and you're seeking whatever he can do for you with all your heart, he will work a sign and a wonder, something outside of the natural order of things, a miracle right there within you, and you'll wholeheartedly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be saved. That's why these things are important. These were done in Egypt so that the Egyptians could see who God really is. He's not a natural God. He's a supernatural God. He's got power over all things. And through ten, it says plagues often in the Bible. But the word there is still the same word for smiting or striking. He strikes Egypt ten times. And at the end of the tenth striking, Pharaoh finally sends them out. Now this is just the first of the strikings. But it's serious. The land is covered in blood. Blood is, you know, blood in the Old Testament under the law is it's unclean. If it's spilled out, it has to be buried. It has to be covered up. You can't leave it out. If a person is, you know, if a woman has blood or she can't, you know, she can't be touched. If a, if a man has blood, it has to be clean. He has to be purified from that. If you touch a dead body, I mean, you know, blood, according to God, is the life of the flesh. Without it, you're dead. And God treats that life with a certain degree of respect. He just won't have it spilled out. It's got to be covered up. Now, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Just imagine standing at a river that is just filled with blood. 
It's just blood. Everything in it's dead. They can't, you know, fish can breathe water, but they can't breathe blood. They're all dead. And you know how fish smell when they die. Fish had been in that river in abundance and the Egyptians relied upon the fish to eat. No more. They relied upon the crops that water would help grow. No more. At least not for a long time until this is all cleaned out. The, even though these, these strikings by God, these plagues that are sent, these signs and wonders that he brings down, which is what he said he would do. I'm going to bring signs and wonders upon Egypt. It's still so that they will believe. It's so that they will believe, that they will know who I am. When, when the Lord worked that sign and wonder in my heart, I knew who he was. I didn't know anything about him until that happened. But when he happened, I knew who he was. All I had been seeking was God, whatever that meant. But when I got saved, I knew that that was the Lord Jesus Christ. He let me know who he was. That's what he did with Paul. You know, Saul on the road to Damascus, he got struck down. He saw this great light. He didn't know what to do. He was terrified. He became blinded by it. And he said, who art thou, Lord? He didn't know who, he knew it was Lord at that point, but he didn't know who he was. And the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you have persecuted. <laughs> it's been hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, your rebellion against me has, has been hard on you. And that's how it was with me. We're running out of time here. Um, I'll get back to the text. So the Egyptians did their thing, the magicians of Egypt. And it, you know, Pharaoh, in verse 23, is very sad. So I haven't seen that the magicians, in his estimation, could do the same thing as God through Moses and Aaron. It says, Pharaoh turned. Now the word there, turn, in a sense it can mean repent, and often is translated repent, but that usually means uh, that word uh, to turn towards God. This same word here, which says turned, and translated turned, it, but it's a different Hebrew word, it means to turn away from God. And that's obviously what Pharaoh did. He turned away from the sign and wonder that God had worked and he went to his house. He just said, oh, whatever. And he says, neither did he set his heart to this also. He didn't, he didn't listen to God in the first place went through Moses and Aaron and said, let him go or send him forth out of the land. And he didn't, he didn't have any appreciation for the fact that someone threw down a rod and it became a terrifying serpent or whatever the serpent was, we don't, you know, that's how it's translated. It was terrifying, animal of some sort. And now all the water in Egypt turns to blood and he turns away from that too. He, he doesn't take it to heart. It says, neither did he set his heart to this. He didn't meditate upon it. He didn't understand. He didn't, he didn't try to contemplate the ramifications of what just happened. Here was this incredible sign from God of his ability to do anything he wanted to do. He could, have, he could have sent fire from heaven and burned that land up. He could have picked up that land and thrown the whole nation into the ocean in a moment of time. He could have <coughs> opened up the earth and sucked them all down into hell. He could have done anything because working signs and wonders, miracles, it proves that God is above natural things. He's not constrained by nature. He can do what, and can, he can still do to you or to a nation just exactly what he wants to. And one day he will. I meant to, uh, I've got just a minute. I'm going to read, uh, you know, we talked about turning everything to blood. I think last week I mentioned uh, the book of Revelation showing a similar thing. We're going to read Revelation 16. <clears throat> and I think, I think this is about a future event, but I'm not positive. It could have been the destruction of Rome. But even if it was, it foretells something in the future that's going to happen when this whole world is judged. Revelation chapter 16, verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. 
And the third angel poured out his vials upon the rivers and the fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and washed and shall be, because thou hast thus judged. For they, meaning the people this was brought upon, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. In other words, they earned this judgment. The Egyptians had earned that judgment, and the people living at the time when these angels pour out judgments from God upon this earth, bringing great and terrible destruction, he says, uh, well, they were bloody people, so you gave them blood to drink. Of course, it'll be the death of them, but that's what they deserve. And he says, you're righteous to judge them this way. And one day, they all, all people will be saying amen to that. Well, that's the message such as it is. Wish I could have done better. Bye-bye.